Hi, I'm Katie Akins with Arizona Farm Bureau Ag in the Classroom. And I'm Alicia Gutierrez with Arizona Farm Bureau Agriculture in the Classroom. And we are super excited to be here with you guys to celebrate a very important or special event that is happening here soon. Do you know what I'm talking about? Is it someone's birthday? It is someone's birthday. I know your birthday's coming up, and I'm very excited about that, but... That's not what we're celebrating today. Instead, we are celebrating a very special author's birthday. Do you guys know what an author does? That's right, an author writes the words to the story. So this author happens to be one of my favorite Mine as a kid and even growing up, and that's because he had amazing an amazing ability to write rhyming books. Do you guys know who we're talking about? That's right. Coming up, we are celebrating Dr. Seuss's birthday. In fact, did you know his birthday is March the 2nd? Yes. Yes, and although he's not with us anymore, we all enjoy celebrating his birthday and reading the many stories that he has brought into our lives. And so one of the things that we would like to do today is read our favorite Dr. Seuss story. How many of you guys have heard of... Why, oh, why are deserts dry? Has anybody heard of that before? It's not your everyday Dr. Seuss book. It's not the cat in the hat. It's not one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish, or Mr. Brown can move, can you? But it does have the very important character, the cat in the hat. All right, so show us that you're ready for the story and to listen carefully. If you're seated at the carpet, crisscross applesauce. If you're seated at, seated at your desks, uh, make sure you're facing forward. We're going to go ahead and put the book on the screen so that you can see the pictures a little bit easier and follow along. Enjoy. Why, oh, why are deserts dry? By Tish Raby. Illustrated by Aristides Ruiz and Joe Matthew. I'm the cat in the hat. And today is the day that we're off to see deserts. Let's leave right away. You may think that deserts are empty and bare, but you'll be surprised by the things we'll find there. Insects and lizards, flowers and snow. Want to see for yourself? Buckle up and let's go. Why are deserts dry? I'll be glad to explain. There are very few clouds above them to bring rain. Without clouds, there is nothing to block the sun's light or to hold the heat in, so it gets cold at night. The air is so dry, any rain deserts get dries up right away, so they do not stay wet. Without water, surviving in deserts is rough. Plants, insects, and animals need to be tough. All living things need to have water, so how? Do they live where it's dry? I will show you right now. Desert plants must find water. Some have ways to store it. Roots spread out to find it or reach deep down for it. Shallow roots of this cactus pull water through them. The cactus then stores it inside of its stem. There's a tree in the desert. It's called a mesquite. Its roots reach for water. That's down 40 feet. The Sonoran Desert is where we will find a very big cactus that's one of a kind. It's called the saguaro, and I have been told it can grow to be over 200 years old. A cactus, you see, has deep pleats in its skin but they will expand when the water flows in. It soaks up the water and then quickly swells. Like a sponge, it stores water in some of its cells. Sharp spines protect it. Just how do they do it? They make sure some animals won't try to chew it. This Gila woodpecker knows very well that a cactus will serve as the perfect hotel. She pecks a small hole and then slips inside. It's cool and it gives her a safe place to hide. When she's ready to leave, well, I have little doubt. Someone else will move in after she has moved out. 
How do insects get water? What some of them do is get water that's inside the plants that they chew. These desert insects are honeypot ants. All year long, they collect the sweet nectar from plants. They store it inside them and then they can feed it to ants who are hungry whenever they need it. The Namib Desert gets rain rarely and yet, fog comes from the sea and makes everything wet. Here the fog basking beetle has a way to survive, getting water it needs to help it stay alive. It tilts its abdomen up, water droplets soon slide down its body and into its mouth open wide. Animals differ in the food that they eat and the ways they keep cool in the dry desert heat. In the daytime, small animals stay underground. Later on, when it's cooler, they move above ground. This cute fennec fox's furry soled feet help him walk on hot sand. His big ears let out heat. Kangaroos lick their arms to cool off their skin. Then each digs a hole in the ground and climbs in. We ask this lizard how he spends his days. Each morning he's warmed by the sun's gentle rays. By midday it's hotter and it's time to hide. He slips into his burrow and goes deep inside. In the late afternoon, he is back in the sun. It is not as hot now and the day's almost done. Then he's back in his burrow to sleep through the night. He'll be up with the sun just as soon as it's light. Hawks, eagles, and vultures fly high in the air. They stay off the ground. It's much cooler up there. Kangaroo rat never drinks, but she eats lots of seeds. The water inside them is all that she needs. Roadrunners can fly but they usually run. They catch lizards and snakes in the hot desert sun. The Sahara Desert, geographers say, is almost as big as the whole USA. Here the crowned sand grouse flies high in the sky, miles and miles to find water, and I'll tell you why. His babies are thirsty and waiting for him. So when he finds water, he quickly flies in. He soaks up his feathers until they are wet. This water is all that his babies will get. They drink from his feathers, which dry soon, and then he must take to the sky to find water again. Out here in the desert, when winds start to blow, there are few plants to help hold the sand down and sow. The wind blows the sand, which forms into dunes. It makes shapes in the sand, like these crescent moons. What's this nomad wearing? It's called a burnoose. It protects him from sun. It is long and it's loose. People called nomads spend their whole lives here. They move place to place and keep moving all year. In the Mojave Desert, plants bloom grow and die, but they leave seeds behind in the ground and that's why when it rains these seeds burst into flowers so bright there's a rainbow of colors, a beautiful sight. They will not live long, but before it is over there are lilies, primroses, sunflowers, owl clover. Some flowers stay open for only one day Hummingbirds drink their nectar and then fly away. In the shimmering heat of the sun's burning glare, you might think you see something that's not really there. This is called a mirage. It's a bit like a dream. Things you think you are seeing are not what they seem. When you get a bit closer, things fade out of sight. They were not there at all. It's a trick of the light. In a dry, dusty desert, if you suddenly see 
something green up ahead, like some plants or a tree. This is called an oasis, where these plants are growing. Somewhere in the ground, there is water that's flowing. Some deserts are hot in the sun's burning light, but the temperature falls and it gets cold at night. Then the world comes alive with owls, foxes, and bats, coyote and rabbits, mice, deer, and rats. Nocturnal animals come out and soon they search to find food by the light of the moon. Before the sun rises, they all disappear. You would think all the animals never were here. Not all deserts are hot. The next place we'll go is the Gobi, and here we will find ice and snow. This back tree and camel is happy to meet you. Some camels have one hump, Bactrians have two. If he goes a long time without eating or drinking, the humps on his back start steadily shrinking. They're not filled with water, but instead contain fat. When he can't eat or drink, he keeps going on that. I filled up my bathtub and filled up my sink. That's about at one time what a camel can drink. He can drink 30 gallons of water and then he can go a whole week before he drinks again. Antarctica is the largest desert of all. The air is so cold here that rain does not fall. This desert is covered with ice and with snow. The ice never melts here and freezing winds blow. It is dark in the winter and cold through the year. Though scientists visit, no people live here. Penguins have a way to survive the cold weather. They get close to each other and huddle together. Today you've seen things that few people will see and I am so happy you saw them with me. A desert, it's true, is a harsh habitat, but I hope you've discovered it's much more than that. No day in a desert is ever the same, and once you've been there, you are glad that you came. All right, how many of you guys like that story? I did. I like that story, although it has some very hard words, <laughs> <Yes>. right? <laughs> But we are going to leave that um, book. Your teacher has that book yep. and uh, you get to keep it for your classroom library to help you remember all of the things about water and even deserts that we learned through that story. So in our story, we actually learned a lot about deserts, but also insects and plants that need water. Mm -hmm. Everything needs water. Yes, everything. Everything needs water. So do you guys need water too? Of course you need water, right? So can you see, think of some of the ways that you guys use water? Okay, you take a bath or a shower, very good. Oh, you brush your teeth? <laughs> How about drink lots of water, especially yeah. when you're in the desert, right? So yes, those are all great answers. And we use water in lots of different ways. The ways that you've mentioned and also a lot more. But one of the things that we want to talk about is something you didn't mention. And that's your clothes. Hmm. Did you know that you needed water for your clothes? Well, yes, because what do we make most of our clothes from? Cotton. Cotton. And of course, cotton is grown by our farmers. So today we're going to learn about how farmers move water and how they conserve water. But more importantly, we're going to talk and remember that water use is not water waste, right? So there's a lot of water that's used in agriculture, especially here in Arizona, but it is to provide us with all of the many things that we use each day. So, Miss Alicia, do we live in a desert here in Arizona? Yes, we do. What desert do we live in? Mm, do you guys know? Sonoran? Good, Very yes. good. So we live in the Sonoran Desert, and that's a pretty unique place because the Sonoran Desert is only in Arizona, in parts of Mexico, and a very small part of California. So very special that we are part of the Sonoran Desert. 
Now, because we live in the desert, water is, is pretty important, right? Now, when we talk about farming in the desert, what do most people think that we grow? Cactus. Cactus, yeah. Do we grow more than cactus? We definitely grow more than cactus. In fact, some fun facts about Arizona agriculture. We are the winter lettuce capital of the world. Yeah. We grow more lettuce in the winter time than any other place. We rank number two in a lot of things. Yeah, a lot of things. Things hopefully that you guys eat. Do you eat um, cauliflower? Broccoli? Yep. Do you like lemonade? Ugh. We're number two in lemons, right? So we produce lots and lots here in Arizona. In fact, it is a $23 billion industry, producing more than just cactus. But as you know, in the desert, we do not get a lot of water. No. no. We learned in the story, in those deserts, they didn't get a lot of water. So one of the trees that we have here in our state, the mesquite tree, which you might be familiar with, it is adapted by creating really long roots that can go 40 feet underground to get to the water. Well, our cotton and our lettuce don't have roots that grow 40 feet. No. So our farmers have to bring water to our crops since it doesn't come to us through the rain. So the process of bringing water to crops is called irrigation. Can you guys say irrigation? Irrigation. irrigation. Now there are lots of different ways that we can bring water to our crops through irrigation. And we're gonna show up, go ahead and show you guys a little video that explains irrigation. Sit back and enjoy. All right, so in our video, we learned that there are some different ways to irrigate, and there's different reasons for using those different ways. So let's do a little review about right. some of the irrigation techniques that we use here in Arizona. All right. Ooh, Ooh have you guys seen this before? You saw it in the video. video. Do you remember what it was called? This is one of the oldest forms of irrigation. Flood, flood irrigation, irrigation. Good job. very good. So this is really important when they go to make the rows that they make them very level to make sure that the water, you see how the water is level, there's no big puddles, okay? So that that water doesn't go to one side of the field and not water some of the crops. So that's a really important thing that they have to do, use technology to make it flat like that. And they can use this to water all the plants and then that water is gonna go through the soil down back into the aquifers. Do you guys know what an aquifer is? Is that like an underground lake? Yeah, that is. Okay. Okay, so that may, when we use that water, it's going to go down through the soil back into the aquifers so it's not being wasted because we're using it. So what we're learning or what you're saying is that we use the water through flood irrigation, the plants use the amount that they need, and then the rest of that water enters the water cycle. Yes. Either through the ground or maybe even a little bit through evaporation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a little bit. But does that doesn't evaporate. mean that it's gone forever. No. It just means it's a different stage in the right. water cycle. I love the water cycle. Yeah, me too. All right. What is another form of irrigation we learned about? We learned about flood irrigation. Mm. We also learned about, this one's one of my favorites. It makes the circles. Ooh. Right? If you've ever been on an airplane and you look out the airplane window and you see sort of the farm fields in circles and you think, ah, what is that craziness? Yeah, this one looks cool. That was created by pivot, pivot irrigation. irrigation. Good job. Okay, and so this, you can see the water is really close to the ground. See the sprinkler heads there? So when it's going around and watering, that water doesn't evaporate as easily because it's close to the plant, so it's going to the plant quickly. And because it's less water, it's not the mm -hmm. flood irrigation, right. it's not giving it a lot of water at one time. So right. it can take the water that it needs, which is pretty cool. So what was this called again? Pivot, Pivot irrigation. irrigation. Good Very good. All right. Now, one other form of irrigation they talked about in the video was drip, 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 Ooh. drip. I'm sure drip you guys irrigation. have seen this before. Even at your house, in the parks by your house. Your or at your school. Your apartment complex. There probably is some drip irrigation somewhere. And the neat thing about drip irrigation is it does exactly what it says. 
it drips little droplets of water directly to the plant. So you can see that there's not water going everywhere, but going directly to the plant itself. And it's giving those plants the exact amount of water that they need. Not too much, not too little, so that we can use different emitters that, dr that drip different amounts of water for different plants. So we can give them the exact amount of water that they need. And there's another form of irrigation that some of our Arizona farmers are using that's similar to drip, but it's called subsurface irrigation. Do you know what that means? Subsurface? That's right, that means underground. So here you can see a pump and those lines that you would see on the drip irrigation, instead of being on top of the soil, are underneath the soil. And they are delivering water directly to the plant's root zone. And it also then doesn't evaporate. Yeah, it eliminates some of the evaporation because under the soil is a lot cooler than it is with the sun shining right on top of the soil. So really helps with uh, conserving water and using every single drop uh, to the benefit of the plant and to use only what we need. Do so, all of our farmers use this type of irrigation? No, and that's because it's really, really expensive to put that technology in. If you think about it, you'd have to prepare all of the fields, right? And then purchase all of those tapes to put underneath. And then you have to be careful every time you're replanting a crop because you don't want to plow through your subsurface irrigation. So there's a lot of expense that goes into it and farmers that are able to do it when it makes sense for their farming operation and their business. So this is subsurface, which is just basically underground drip irrigation. All right. All right. So now we've learned a little bit about irrigation. I think we should give them a little STEM challenge. Yeah, I like okay? challenges. Now, the STEM challenge, not only do you have to do the activity, but you have to find parts or pieces through your classroom that you can use because we can't give you the items that we have. So here's the challenge, okay? You guys are going to create a irrigation system to get water to your crops. Now, for this STEM challenge, you guys are going to need to create a ditch to transport the water from the canal to your crops. Now, there's several things that you should be keeping in mind through this STEM challenge. One is you don't want the water to go from the ditch to the crops too fast or you'll flood out your crops. Mm -hmm. You don't want it to go too slow because you might not be able to get all the water to your crops. And you really need to be careful with that ditch. Make sure that there's no holes, there's no cracks that would allow that water to seep out, okay? You want to use every drop of water that is coming from that canal. So as you might imagine, we are going to be using flood irrigation for this challenge, okay? So we have some supplies that we're gonna show you and maybe once this presentation is over, you can find some supplies in your classroom to use. So the very first thing is we need water. I don't want to get all wet, so we're going to use beads. Ours happen to be blue because, well, water. water. Okay, we have our beads. And then what could we use for our ditch, to make a ditch? Well, I have some of these big index cards. Okay. Now, if you don't have a four by six index card or something like that to use, they could use regular paper too, probably. Yeah. yeah. And you're going to form it into a ditch. And then, well, we had the ability, so we went ahead and made a lettuce crop that we want to water. Why lettuce, you say? Because as I said before, Arizona is the winter lettuce capital of the world. We grow more lettuce in the winter months than any other place. Super cool. You don't have to have lettuce. You can use something else for your crop, okay? Now, the key is, again, you want to build a ditch that is not going to leak water. So as you move through your STEM challenge, make sure you are doing modifications to make sure that water is not escaping the ditch. If you do the STEM challenge, we would love for your teachers to take a picture and send it to us at AITC at azfb.org so that we can post them and see all of the amazing ideas that you came up with. So we are super bummed that we can't be in your classroom with you today doing this hands-on activity with you, but we still do have a way for you to showcase, besides the STEM activity or the STEM challenge, um, what you learned today. 
So we've emailed your teacher a worksheet that you are going to use to match irrigation techniques with different scenarios, okay? So the irrigation techniques we learned about today, which was, what was one of them? Yeah, so we had flood, flood irrigation. irrigation. Okay, what was another one? We had the drip irrigation, very good. What was the one that was underground? Subsurface. Good. And what's the one that makes the funny circles? Pivot, pivot, pivot yeah. irrigation, okay? So when you get your worksheet, one of the examples is gonna say, hmm, this type of irrigation is the oldest form of irrigation. It's used to spread water evenly through the field and oftentimes is used for crops like cotton and corn. Hmm. Which of our irrigation techniques that we talked about today would fit that? Remember, the oldest form. That's right, that would be our flood irrigation. So there you go, we've already given you one of the answers to your worksheets. There are also some fun scenarios on there that give you a scenario about a farm and a farmer and you have to match which one would be the best farming or irrigation technique for that specific farm. So good luck and have fun with it. And remember that water use is not water waste. Our farmers are using water every day to produce the things that we are using. And to help you remember that, we have given your teacher a little gift to give to each of you, and it's a pencil. Why? Because this is school. Are these uh, normal pencils? No. So one, these are really cool looking blue pencils, but also when they get warm, <laughs> my hands are warm so they're already changing, they change colors. So your pencil is going to turn white, white as you get warm, okay? Now, one of the things that I really like about these pencils is what they say. What does your pencil say? It takes seven gallons of water to grow a head of lettuce. Do you guys oh. know that? Now remember, a gallon is like those clear Jug. jugs of milk, right? That's a gallon. Okay, how about this? It takes 18 gallons of water to grow your apple. So as you can see, water use is not water waste. The water used in agriculture produces all of the things that we need and we use, and the other water goes right back to the water cycle. So I hope you guys enjoyed learning about water today. Thank you for having us, even if it was virtually into your classroom. Hopefully next time we'll get to see you in person.